Are you ready for this? We have a very special guest today, the positively inimitable Perry Farrell. Perry, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm doing great, David. Having a good day in the studio and uh, interested and excited to speak with you. Well, thank you. And here at Sonic Scoop, we say every day is a good day in the studio. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Almost every day. (laughs) <laughs> yeah right, yeah right dustin and well, absolutely <laughs> and because this is sonic scoop we not only have perry but his longtime studio engineer dustin mosley dustin glad you could make it yeah pleasure great yeah we got a lot to go over you guys are both here because of the recent release perry farrell the glitz the glamour box set a 35 year solo retrospective of his life music and an ounce uh, an art outside of the work of Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros. This is a nine vinyl box set that comes with tons of goodies in addition to the music. And a lot of these are special treats for the audio inclined among us. Uh, so it's an amazing collection. You've got to hear it from top to bottom. It's out on Last Man Music and you can easily find it by visiting perryfarrellmusic.com. Perry and Dustin, there's so much to dive into here. So are you ready? Absolutely. (laughs) All right. In the words of Perry Farrell, let's go. Yeah. All right. (laughs) With a lot of of reverb and delay coming after that. Um, So Perry, tell me about your evolution as a studio artist. When did it go from just being a place that you recorded to being able to use the studio as an instrument? You know, I I think that uh, my interest in uh, generating amazing sound started actually in a basement in Laurel Canyon. I got a little mixer and a microphone and I was living in a basement and I had headphones on like I do now, went into the little mixer and I could sing into this microphone and it sounded when I dialed up the reverb it sounded pretty good but it was all a cappella. so i started that's how i started to hone my craft as a vocalist and really dialing into the voice because that was that was my ambition but it was the only instrument that i could hear back i got really deep into the aspects of the reverb and the subtlety of the voice. It was as if I was a man alone in a cave. And the only way to hear sound is to generate it yourself. (laughs) Yes, yeah. Um, And when, up until that point, so I take it you've been singing a lot, right? Uh, No, I, I started singing at age 21. Okay. I started I started uh, my first group, my first shot at um, a stage was at 21. Right. But Dustin, mm-hmm. now you're a man who you went to a college for this, right? Yeah. Yeah. I went to, to Full Sail in uh, 2001. And um, Full Sail College, is that out in Texas? In Florida. It's in Florida. So you're from Texas. Yeah, yeah, from Austin, Texas. Austin. You went to this college in Florida for sound design and yeah, yeah, engineering engineering. and mixing. And and I just I love synthesizers. I I bought a um, module of the month uh, MOTM uh, large format um, uh, module uh, modular synth and started soldering it together from kits. Is that is that what you did there? Uh, no, this is this is a newer controller that we're uh, that we're using. Um, DJ Tech Tools, the, oh. the Twister. Okay. Uh, Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah it's uh, beautiful. Great piece. Uh, both buttons and knobs, and but uh, yeah, we're we're using this for uh, for the new uh, live um, delay rig and all. Uh, so so what we're doing um, to go back to the voice for a moment because obviously that's. Uh, I'm best at that. I'm certain, you know, best utilized the voice. Um, Dustin is incredible with electronics and the latest technology and applying that 
in a in the production of a of a, a modern composition. And so <clears throat> what I'm what I'm onto with with the voice is I want to continue to develop the aspects that started with that reverb, but now what we can do with it um, with the, the software and um, <clears throat> we can take that voice, not only reverb it, but we can do some, what name off some things other filtering, chorus, infinite, infinite effects. It's, it's, Wonderful. I mean, there's so many options, uh, but I mean, so much of, of uh, y- your work has been with, with that excellent uh, Ibanez delay. And so I, the main thing I wanted to be able to recreate that sound, the ability to hold and almost almost sample the way he's using the delay and in, in, in larger delay yeah. times and bending it up and down. But, you know, Live sampling, sampling right on the spot. You take off, you take off from the last note, you hold that last part. I don't know. It's just instinct in my mind now, but it took me years when I went from Psycom to Jane's Addiction. I originally was just performing with Eric, the bassist. Right. He would just come up with a groove, and then I had a little delay unit and my microphone and an amp, and then I would catch a loop off of what he was playing with my voice. And then I'd sing against the loop, let the loop go, and I would improvise. But I work. I was working on songs loosely with, I had, you know, written lyrics that I was developing, and I would just try different parts of the poem, if you will. And then that's, that's how I started to re- be interested in, in avant-garde, the avant-garde aspects of sound and music designing sound and music um and so here we are in 2021 and and, um, (laughs) and there's and there's still there's still miles in front of us as far as uh production the new the new things that we have to work with are super exciting. You know, we still work with the rock band. I mean, literally the, the living, breathing rock band people. We, you know, we love musicians and the, the, um, you never know what's going to come out of a human being, you know, there it's, it's always exciting when human beings are making music. And then we apply and add as an additive, the new, the newest technology and um, recording design. Is that the right term for it? I like that. I I like recording Recording design. design. Yeah. Yeah. That just got invented right here. (laughs) So with that, I wanted to to, uh, let you guys in on a song that we're working on. You'll, You'll be familiar with it. So I don't know what, what came over me, but I had this desire to work with, I know what it was. I love Johnny Cash. So I had this desire to, to write mariachi tracks because Ring of Fire was one of my favorite songs. I just think it's awesome. Yep. So I heard, I had the chance and opportunity to go out to perform that song in front of the Carter Cash family. And they told me the story of how it was written as Johnny had a buddy who was in a mariachi band and he asked, and June actually wrote the song, but then Johnny had his friend orchestrate because mariachis always write out their songs as we've come to find out. It's no improvising. They have their parts and they work them out. So that's how Ring of Fire was um, it was uh, arranged and composed. It's a trippy composition if you listen to it. Love is a burning, ba ba da ba da ba da da two three, and it makes a fiery, ba ba da ba da ba da one two three four. Now that's how it goes. It's 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 hard to 
Oh, that yeah. sounds great. You got to be counting and all that. But so anyway, I redid Stop, Stop with Dustin and um, who else worked on the track? Uh, we had uh, Nick Mayberry. We had Kind uh, Heaven Orchestra. Yeah, Heaven. Nick, uh, ba- Nick Mayberry. Uh, Brendan uh, Br- Buckley. Br- Brendan Buckley on drums. We had, uh, Matt Rohde was there. Matt Rohde and a mariachi orchestra. Yeah. So I got my wish. So now we started working on it, but we're going to take all those players and, you know, Dustin actually came up with an incredible angle that I'll share with you. It's, it's, I think a step forward in product in the uh, ideas of production, production, uh, te- you know, techniques rather than put things on a grid and just say it's it's at 120 shut up and deal with it we allow the band to play and then dustin and i'll let you explain it in further detail he will take an average of each part and grid the part so that when the natural the natural inclination to speed up in let's say a chorus or a bridge we give that we give that, you know, we, we, we record it and we just organize it a little bit more so that we can use synths behind that. Okay. So it's the, the players get to just have their, you know, their, their energy and their, uh, uh what's I want to say, uh, their performance, right. And how they're feeling. Doing you the want to talk yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, kind of a blend between with all the technology now being able to to get timing just right and all of that i think that's all great but I, you know sometimes you can kind of lose everything and certain sure. songs are just better if they speed up in the choruses and, and uh so it's it, yeah kind of a blend start with a with a beat mapping of, of the full song but then also going in and tightening areas that you do if you do want to fix something here or there if you want to try it a little slower there or mm-hmm. or maybe the whole chorus should be a consistent speed you know Right. Playing around with, with, with all that. Dusty, are you doing this in Pro Tools? Yeah, we, we mostly, um, when we're on the mixing side and the tracking side, we're in Pro Tools. If we're writing, um, often in Ableton Live, uh, a big fan of Live. Are there particular uh, um, applications within Pro Tools that, that are making that easier for you to do to play with these tempos? Because the engineers watching this are definitely going to want to try some of these tricks themselves. Feel free to dig deep and in, it, it will help it, done. it yeah. will help to keep the integrity of uh you know the energy of a human being and as far as i'm concerned you know um that's a step forward as i say and then the best part of it all is when you go to make stems or do remixes you might choose a certain section it's mapped yeah, I, I, so I mean, I, I've done before. I've, I've used uh, Beat Detective for uh, okay. for gridding. This time, I was, I was just using Identify Beat. Just quickly knock in each each bar, and uh, and work from there. And I, I usually I started with like a bar quantization, and if I need more, I'll I'll go deeper. But uh, quickly get the whole song up that way. And then uh, Elastic Time in uh, in Pro Tools is is pretty great. Um, I, you know, usually the uh, what's it called. Um, Oh geez, the the better algorithm. There's multiple algorithms. Um, okay, and there's one that they license from uh, Isotope that that sounds really good. Uh, X form. Right. Oh, which and one? So, Sorry, uh, X form. Okay. So so I, I you know I usually start with something uh, just mono to to make it quick, and then when you actually want to print it, switch over to X form. It, it it sounds a good a bit quite a bit better. Okay, great. All right, and and I'll tell you for for real songs, we have a another song that we're working on it, it usually happens that at the end of the song we have this speed up giddy up part get out of town kind of a <laughs> you know what i mean like we're all banditos getting the heck out of here we got the loot you know and so it was really great to keep as i say the integrity of the drummer who in this case the song i'm thinking of taylor hawkins is like and he just I don't know what tempo it was exactly, but you do. But I just know it felt great to have it at that tempo and not be like tied to something, 
you know, we shouldn't be tied to a machine. The machine should be tied to us. Exactly. Yeah. It's all about using the technology to, to help, help the performers do what, what they do best and, right. and not try to force it upon them. I think, you know, if, if we tried gritting that song fully up, it just didn't work. It just lost, yeah. lost the energy. Didn't yeah. Right. When it was most important, yeah. <laughs> it was held back. Right. Right. So it sounds like Perry, you're very focused. Uh, it sounds like you, it sounds like from what you're talking about, from your experiences early on, the uh, like working with delay uh, in reverb that uh, for you, it wasn't about, singing it dry and then putting putting it on afterwards it was about getting inspiration from from those effects and letting them help guide you not just be a part of the mix right well treating the voice is like dressing you know i mean you know you can have a beautiful body and always keep your shirt off but you can do that too but i like i like dressing i like jewelry and I like the same thing. I like to adorn the voice. Right. Yep. And it sounds like you like to get started that way. Uh, and, and that takes you places. Well, sure. As I say, when I started out, it was like I was in a cave. And the only way to hear anything was to generate the sound yourself. Yeah. So therefore, I was kind of like talking to myself and then refining that conversation. One, how I want to hear myself and or or a friend or you know my uh my soul partner now speaking of that dustin and perry how long have you two been working together now uh, it was uh i think the first thing we worked on was the the twilight the go all the way really thing. i think so so twilight was what 15 years ago yeah, something like that yeah feels like it Right. Between 12 and 15 years. All right. right. Yeah. So how'd that come about? You were, were you just hired for a studio session, Dustin, or? Actually, so, uh, um, uh, Perry was working with, uh, Atticus Ross on that track. And, um, at the time I actually, uh, rented a room, uh, from Atticus and, and worked with him, uh, doing tech work and, and sound design and stuff. And, uh, and uh, honestly, didn't know what was going down. They just called me down one day, and, and Perry was in there. I was like, "Oh, this is this is cool." <laughs> like, right. What are we? Oh, okay, cool. And, and then, uh, did you work on um, when Jane's recorded? Yeah, with Trent and. Well, so I, I think I missed that one, but I came in for the for the Jane's record for uh, Great uh, Skateboarders. Yeah. 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 Right. That was that was a blast. Well, <laughs> so yeah. now you guys obviously hit it off. It wasn't just a session. Perry, what was it about working with Dustin that made you think this is an engineer I want to I want to stick with and, and have around? Well, um, aside from everything else he can do mechanically and technically, which is amazing. I mean, he can get a sound. You can you can bet on that sound, you know, that that sound is not going to screw up your mix. It's only it's going to be something that is as forward thinking as one can think, because he's constantly revising and reviewing equipment and software. And he's, you know, he's got friends. They kind of what what do you call it when you kind of geek out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> on, uh, whatever's <laughs> happening, like lately. I'm not talking, yeah. you know, I'm not talking Neve boards. I'm talking about like what's happening today. So I can, I can rest assured that he'll bring that to the party or bring that into the studio. But in all honesty, you know, he, he mixed my voice and he got my voice together and it sounded great. He did such an incredible job on the voice. In other words, because here's what happens when you're in a, when you're in a group to this happens. I would always consider myself the last. So I would get everybody mixed. I'd get everybody organized and then I would go last. And then sometimes I'd run out of time. And so I always felt like sometimes in the past, my voice, I wish I could have put more time and work into it. You know, when I started to work with Dustin, Dustin, really uh it was in his hands right and 
he just took his time, did all the, you know, like every move and decision he did vocally with me. And because you have to understand right now, what I'm up to is I'm up to working with very exotic chords, uh, chordal structures in the, in the chorusing of the voice. Like I, I love, we have this one, um, what is that thing? Uh, that, on the iPad. Yeah, on the iPad. Yeah, yeah there's a, a great uh, app uh, called, I think it's called Navicord, and there's a couple like it, but it's, uh, it essentially, it uses the Tonnens lattice, which was, I think, invented in like the 1700s or 1600s, okay. but uh, just a way of viewing harmonies and, and viewing triads um, and how all the, how that would all work. And then you can tell it what key you're in. It'll show you all the chords that are in key, but you can then also know how to push out of key and how to shift around. It's, it's almost very... like, have you ever seen the tree of life, the, uh, in the Kabbalah, you know, the tree of life yeah. and it's got these sephirot and then these pathways out of the sephirot, right? Okay. Yes. Well, that's yeah, what this, sure. that's what this software looks like on an iPad. Nice. It's okay. got, it's got your main note. And then pathways out to other notes that would work in a triad. Okay. And the reason I love it is because lately I, I feel like there's a whole open world and open sky uh, of music to be made going into strange chords that take you off guard. And it doesn't have to be like every note, but at the right place, at the right e event of a song to have an, an incredible choral structure that that creates a, a, a chorus and harmony that just blows your mind, uh, right? for lack of a better phrase. And so, yeah, so we're dropping those in, in subs through the song. And I'm also trying to, to get them with the voice, too. So we have these great sessions where we're just dropping in these crazy chords. Um, it's, it's where David Bowie was going before he passed. It's where the Beatles got their magic from, you know, at certain moments in their sure. songs. Yes. Bah! The Hendersons will all be there. Yes. You know, dun, 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 dun. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting <laughs> with, the, with the tech these days, it's easy to, to kind of think, oh, we're bowling and someone put up the, the guardrails. But yes. it doesn't have to be that way as well. Sometimes it's it's the rules that you can push against and, and seeing that spelled out for you, um, you know, well, let the technology help help do the, the math for you you know dustin i think that, yeah i think it's cool. very difficult for people to realize when they're you know when they're when they're in that box how do you how do you how do you take a step back uh and say hey i'm i'm doing <laughs> i'm doing this because this is the right thing to do this is what i know i'm supposed to do but i'm going to try something else you know how, how do you break that that wall when you're in the studio yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's a few a few paths. I mean, it, it, acknowledging it's the, obviously the first step because you can't uh, make a change if you don't see that happening. Um, but yeah, you know, it's um, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you say, Perry? <laughs> Hit me again. What's the question? Yeah, how do you know? How do you know when you're doing? How do you get to that point where you know you have to break a rule? Uh, where you're you're operating under oh yes okay I'll tell you for me I, I there's a song recently that came out really great but for the longest time it was what we were calling a meat pie <laughs> so it was like all this crap and every time we put another flavor on top it was like putting more mustard and more ketchup on your hot dog is like right. cut it stop. Mm -hmm. stop something is buried there man you got to dig you can't be like filing on right. you got to be man and getting rid of so um that's when i feel 
Yeah, that's that's when you got to break a rule. I got that's it. when you got to go stop. We got, what? Let's let. How did we get out of it? So <laughs> what we did was <laughs> Dustin came in one day and I said, I don't know what to do. I'm honestly I'm out of ideas. The song's called Mend. You'll hear it come soon enough. It's okay. It's it's awesome. Um, Taylor Hawkins is on it. Is David Bryan on it from yeah. Bon Jovi? Uh, Elliot Easton. Elliot Easton from The Cars. Yeah. So he came back and he said, all right, here's what it is. What We don't have an acoustic guitar there. And he said, I went and listened to um, Fleetwood Mac because the song is kind of like got the... You know, Fleetwood Mac had a big sound. Right. And they had um, that amazing guitar player. Uh, uh, Lindsey uh, Buckingham. Lindsey yes. Buckingham <laughs> yes. with beautiful guitar work. Right. And so he was able to g- cut through this song, almost like split the, the bun open. Yeah. Yeah. With <laughs> his guitar work. Wow. And that's what we needed. We had all bun. It was ah. like all bun. <laughs> so... We we brought in Nick Mayberry, kind of have an orchestra, amazing guitar player, and he's a great in the studio too. And I just um, explained to him that I have fallen in love with the 1940s period of, of music. It was very beautiful and noble, romantic, bold, and even masculine and courageous. To play it on an acoustic guitar, like, could you drop something in like that? And he played the beautiful, almost sounded almost Spanish, you know, like, um, yeah, for sure. You know, Spain had great guitar work and great guitarists. They started to play guitar like 12th, 10th century, 12th century. Right. So... That wow. sound is really amazing and it's deep and it's ancient. Wow. And it made it to me, it, it the song started to become great from that idea and that suggestion of Dustin's. Right. Yeah, it's odd sometimes the, the smallest push in one direction can suddenly change the entire view. And then things start making more sense, or you can make better decisions of you know, oh, we should get rid of that because this other direction is the way to go yes so so with some addition by subtraction and also some some reorientation uh within it uh perry you mentioned something that i've been thinking about a lot lately which is listening to old music um and i'm curious about what that what the role uh might play in your own creativity and your inspiration, it, you know, what, what is the specific value in listening to music from the the forties or, or the thirties? What, what, what do you get from that? What can we get from that? Well, if you want to talk about the forties, so 1940s were here in Los Angeles, the golden era of Hollywood. So when I would watch these beautiful movies from the 1940s, although the atrocities were happening in Europe and it was awful, but in America, they called it the golden era of Hollywood because, uh, you know, the, the costumes, the, the movie sets, the, uh, the score, the acting, uh, and the musicianship, you know, you had Leonard Bernstein doing, you know, on his way to West Side Story. But uh, there was one particular movie, I think it's called Blood and Sand. Yeah, I think so. And uh, it was about a bullfighter in the 1940s who uh, came from a very small village. And there was a lot of uh, music in the movie there'd be just one number of then, you know, a band would begin to play and the woman would come out and she would play the castanets on another stage and the men would be drinking and, you know, the woman would be dancing and they'd be playing cards and uh, listening to the uh, bullfighting critic on his comments on the bullfighters that were coming that, that weekend. 
and one's a bum and the other one is a hero. And the music was just done so well. And again, I go to the voice. The voice was similar to, you know, the, our modern mariachi and the way that the men, you know? Wow. And I just thought, man, those were, those were like, those were some studs. Those were some true men right there. Uh, as far as musicians, I want to, I want to um, put, mix that in a little bit to my music. So guess what? I, everything we've been doing since I saw that movie, there's a layer of <clears throat> that uh, um, approach to voice. Right. It's in there. And it's it's awesome. Right. Some bravado. So that's why, yeah, but now when I take that and I put it into the strange note area. Oh, eh, you know? Yes, yes, yeah. So it goes somewhere different. Um, and, and then on the other hand, though, so, so now I see why it, it's such an interesting dynamic because, Dustin, you're on the other end what you're doing is you're sounds like you're inventing things right <laughs> on, on the Sometimes. fly yeah. uh, and uh so so when you tell me about the one the one software that you <laughs> like looks like a sea urchin <laughs> let's just waving it. at you and you take oh, it you oh, yeah. around no listen there's some, well, some great things out there um uh output uh has some pretty interesting stuff going on with like uh oh what is it called it's called portal Right. Um, that guy. Yeah, that's that's a fun one. Unique interface, fun fun thing to work with, like immediacy, but also not a preset that everybody has. It's it once again about performance, kind of. You know. Yes. You get to perform the the effect more than just throw it on there and and forget about it. I mean, sure. That still has purpose, but you know. Absolutely. But but if it's human doing that, you're unstoppable. Like that's what got me into dance music is when i would listen to producers that were manipulating the effect that blew my mind because when you're you're xing or you know you're a molly right as as i was back in the day back in the day back in the day and then i would listen to the sound and i was going i would wait for it to become st sterile and dead but it wouldn't it would continue to evolve because somebody was controlling it. So I knew there was an intelligence behind there. And that that's what blew my mind. Right. Right. Ah, oh, that sounds fantastic. And, and, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just take this moment to, to interject and say, when we talk about mind blowing moments, like I know what you mean. And I could trace so many of them back to, to times when I was listening to your music, Perry, like, uh, that, that's I have my mind blown many times by you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Yes. Well, it's trials and tribulations. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want to find out. I know something that our audience is going to want to know. Is there a standard uh, vocal path uh, for for Perry Dustin? Is there is there a mic or or specific mics that you use? And what's the signal chain from there when you're recording him? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We. Um... When we were working on uh, the Great Escape Artists, uh, we, we ended up trying out tons of mics. Before that, we, we kind of stuck to uh, a 414 at the time. It sounded pretty good for him. Um, but uh, we wanted something a little bit cleaner. The one we had, it was getting a, a bit of crunch um, in, in the top mids. And so we, we, we did a huge shootout of tons of mics. Um, probably had, I don't know, $100,000 worth of mics that we tried. Uh -huh. And of, of all of them, the thing that we landed on that just worked best for Perry was um, from, uh, it was, a, it was a, a U87, but it was with a tube retrofit from inner tube audio. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it just had, it had some of that cleanness, but if you wanted to push into it, it could get a little harsh and it was just the perfect blend. But yeah, it is, it is odd, you know, with bikes, it, it really is unique to, to the source. Um, I really showed that, but yeah. 
Uh, we're using that, and and we're currently using uh, the Apollo uh, recording system. So okay. uh, I'm using that for yeah, and, and and modeling different mic pre's and and kind of jumping around a little bit, but um, have have some flexibility there. Got it. Uh, it. Is so. It sounds like you need to capture a lot of range, though, right? I mean, yes, yeah. So when I when I'm on the mic, I can be four. I wouldn't say quite four feet, but yeah, I I sometimes will stretch back four feet. Um, doing background voicing, I yeah, I'll go back and back and. Uh, there's just this perfect sweet spot where I feel like I'm actually in the back row of something singing. And then I'll layer like that. Last yesterday we had, <clears throat> I, I was recording Etty, my wife, and <laughs> she was make, she was making me laugh because she was pushing my head like this and going, what is all this you were doing to me yesterday on the mic? And I was, because the mic was um, hot and we were recording her and I wanted her to get right on this mic. It's the mic that uh, Dustin just told you. Yeah. <clears throat> but she goes, look, what do you think Dustin was thinking when you're going like this to me? <laughs> and I go, I didn't really think about it, but because the mic was hot, I was trying to get you I mean, I did it myself. I put my own mouth on there and I was trying to tell her, put your mouth right on it. And the mic was able to handle that because I wanted her to do this whisper, but I wanted it to be a strong whisper or, or a confident whisper. So be, I just want to celebrate. I just want to celebrate. And it was perfect, just like that take. <laughs> nice. Wow. I, I love that we're getting these performances here. Like this was, well, I should have expected it, right? I, I should, what we do. <laughs> I should have been on top of that. Now, there, there are a few things that I want to talk to you about specifically on the box set. Um, so I'm going to shift gears for a minute into that specifically. Um, there's just so much... I heard, and and here we have the adjective mind blowing. I put it right there for the remixes. Um, uh, I said, including the mind blowing vast visitation uh, featuring a recording of the great Jim Morrison. How did this remix come together? Because I am dying to know. Shoot, um, do you do you remember when you first worked on it? It would have been shortly after we met, I think. Really? Yeah. So we started working on it from, then, from scratch. For sure. So uh, the the long the short story is that these people from Israel called me up and told me that they had these tracks of Jim Morrison's. Uh, they uh, Jim Morrison wanted me to have them, <laughs> and I I swear to you that's what happened. And um, I brought the tracks to the Doors estate or Jim Morrison's estate because it was just Jim's voice. Yes. So it wasn't Doors songs, but there were songs like he had melodies going. Anyway, they gave me permission to produce Vast Visitation and another one, a Woman in the Window. So I produced uh, two tracks. They gave me in total, I believe, nine. So I have, <laughs> yeah, eight or nine of them. But I st started getting to work on Bass Visitation and Woman in the Window. Right. And um, what else can I tell you about them? Harry Gregson Williams composed the tracks. Um, yeah, it was for... Satellite Party, the album Satellite Party, and Vast Visitation is for the glitz, the glamour. Okay. Right. So you you can hear both, but you'll get both songs in the box set. Yes. Yeah. It now, for remixing, we had a woman, her name is Sami, from Palestine, do a remix for us. And then we had a 
an Israeli uh, producer, Guy Gerber, do another mix for us. Okay. Terrific. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, so uh, how do you approach a remix? What, uh, you know, how, how, what was kind of the genesis of, of Vast Visitation? So you had the, you had this acapella Jim Morrison vocal then, right? And, and how did it take you, uh, where, you know, where you went from there? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I guess you just start, um, you have to put it on a grid because right. it wasn't on a grid. <laughs> That's a start. And then you have to listen to what he's saying and then uh, pro produce and arrange and compose accordingly. So as an example, Woman in the Window was, yeah. the chorus is just try and stop us. We're going to love. So you've got to put in loving, loving type of uh, backdrop to that. And then, yeah, I decided to make that line, the chorus, just try and stop us. We're going to love. And so, again, put on the chorusing, just try and stop us. We're going to love. We're going to love. Just try and stop us. Of course, he couldn't do all that. But maybe he would like it if he was around, you know. Right. Is that something you thought about? Do, do, I had to. Yes, do, do you were trying to make something that, that Jim is enjoying uh, from. He would be dimension. proud of it. Yeah, yeah, right. absolutely. I mean, um, you know what people what what people didn't know about me in those days at that time is that I actually have spoken to the spirit world. So when they told me that they spoke to Jim Morrison, he wanted me to have these tracks. I um, I have to take them first at their word about it because I've spoken to the spirit world a few times. I know it's possible to do, so I can't disclaim them. No. But I but I'm still going to uh, I'm going to look them up one day and sit down with them because <laughs> I got to hear more. Right. Yeah, and the last thing I wanted to ask you then, Perry, is like your uh, your own connection with with Jim Morrison's voice. Like, how would you characterize Jim Morrison as a, as a singer and a and a performer? Yeah, he he is. Uh, you know, there there was uh, in those realms. I don't say there was anybody better, and he is is amongst the best that I've ever heard and seen. And it was more than his voice because his voice is the result of the man. The man is just amazing. And he got that voice because of who he was. That's so what you're saying when you say he's, you know, his voice is amazing is yeah, he was an amazing person. I didn't know him. I got to meet the other doors and actually record with them. Sure. Wow. Yeah, but um and now I can say, yeah, I've even recorded with Jim. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I can say as a drummer like uh myself, like John Densmore, uh oh, man. I'm, I'm constantly learning more about him as a as a player. I want to, I want to get him to, uh, get on a track with us sometime soon. It sounds like a natural to me. I yeah, say maybe the next one, you make know, make it happen. I'm yeah. going to try. I'm All right. Try. Good. Good. Um, now another thing, uh, I really want to talk about is, is surround sound and Dolby Atmos. Um, uh, that there, there are to 15 total Dolby Atmos mixes in the box set. Is that correct? Um, and uh or or there's several um there's i believe the dolby atmos it's on the blu-ray the album is kind heaven and it was produced with tony visconti oh all right i know tony yeah yeah so uh, it's at the bottom of this box set <laughs> you get a surround sound mix we brought the 
the uh, the stems to Dolby Studios and uh, Mark Binder, who's the head of Dolby Studios, myself, Brendan, you you came over to, and we sat there for what a month or so about yeah, and remixed the album that was mixed in uh, the modern day typical stereo we went 7.2 atmos with it so you know the dub the, the the aspects of dub just the heavens just split open when it came to that because we were sending voices around the room delays around the room strings were popping up electronics were popping up it was it would be like yeah like um the the uh, heavenly hosts had an orchestra sort of that's what it sounded like nice great well i can't wait to get to an atmos room and and really hear it dustin what were you going to add yeah it, you know just the perfect material to take it to atmos as well we had i mean there's so many layers i, I i'm you know it's tony visconti impressive with his his uh, stereo mix getting all that to to fit in but to to have all the room of atmos to to work with it uh it was wonderful material to work with there. oh my god yeah um yeah dustin do what um do you mix some of perry's material also like yeah where yeah. Where, where are you are you credited on some of the songs on the box set um or where does that come in so some of the newer tracks, I've been doing some mixing. Um, before that, I was doing some programming and and uh, and all the vocal recording. Okay, all right, all, all the tracking there. Good. Yeah. So what we added to Tony's team was uh, Dustin and Brendan. Brendan Hawkins is also a longtime uh, partner in the in the studio with us, and uh, Dustin and Brendan were glitching up this and that you know tony was enjoying it i i i have a very strong suspicion he was way into it he's <laughs> asking me hitting me up like where'd you meet these guys you know i'm like uh oh <laughs> <laughs> terrific um, amazing experience a meeting uh, of the mind sure uh, tony's had a front row seat to some of the most legendary music ever made uh yeah made. for sure and, so. and i and i was um over the moon i was you know to to work off with him but off of him too like hey tony let's do a back background vo voicing behind this song you know right and then i would say you know come back with it right and he'd come back with something that was really good you know Hey, Tony, what's again, I, you know, I go to my friends. What's what's not happening with this song? Mm -hmm. You go, OK. And again, it was the acoustic guitar. It always is that acoustic guitar, man. I'm telling you that, that can make <laughs> a difference. Blue. Sure. And as, as the late, great Adam Schlesinger uh, from uh, Fountains of Wayne, uh, uh, I remember he always told me, uh, uh, or at least once, uh, not to underestimate, underestimate what a tambourine can do. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Indeed. I mean, listen to how loud those tambourines are in the 60s. Yes. It's like a tambourine song. Yeah. Yes. He said he said how it can really lift a song. I, I remember. Heck, yeah. Break that down. Yeah, yeah the energy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, percussive energy is fantastic. Yeah. Without saying too much, not getting in the way, but excitement. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, uh, Perry, another thing I wanted to ask you about, because um, we were just talking about Tony Visconti and thinking about producers. And when I was listening uh, to the box set again, I really was blown away by the sonic quality of Ultra Payloaded. Um, that is a fantastic sounding record. Uh, the drums sound fantastic. Again, to me, I, w I was very focused on that, but I just really was it was really great to revisit that and and hear how good it sounds so i i'm just want to know about the recording process i know steve lily white executive produced it what did you know what i'll say how it started right? yeah okay yeah because that really set the precedent 
So I was hanging out at Harry's studio, Harry Gregson Williams studio one afternoon and um, hybrid the electronic produ- producing team hybrid out of the UK were there. Harry works 99.9% of his time is on films. Okay. You know, he does the, um, he did Rid- Ridley and Tony Scott, the Scott brothers. He yeah. did their movies until one of them died. And I remember. Um, Lion it, King? What? Was it Lion King? Uh, uh, you mean Narnia? Okay, yeah. Narnia, he did. He did as a, the film score to Narnia. But um, he just said to me, or those guys said to me, I've got tracks that I, you know, I'd like you to work on or, you know, l- listen to them and like you to hear. So on the, on the tracks was hybrid pro- producing tracks. Then Harry was going to put strings on the tracks. And there was Peter Hook's bass oh. from Joy Division. Oh my God. The New Order. <laughs> wow. He was playing bass. So like, okay. I, I ended up to produce every one of those tracks. I think there was five of them. And then I went on and produced like four more to make it an album. But with that start and that, that kind of amazing uh, contribution to, uh, to the songs already there, I just try to stay true to the integrity of the artist's that I was working with and go with that kind of vibe and then take it somewhere. And so that's how, and then I invited Flea in those days. Flea was in between records. I said, Flea, you want to get in on this? Right. I got these songs. So he, we did together the song Milky Avenue right now. Sasha is remixing it. Believe it or not. Sasha's remixing Milky wow, Avenue. That's going to sound nice. Yeah, but one song I, I love to talk about that, well, there's Woman in the Window, the Jim Morrison track is on it, but there's a song called Awesome. Okay. And Harry puts his orchestra down on it. Peter Hook's playing the bass. And there's incredible tr- programming from um, a hybrid. And then I put, real players on there, Nuno Betancourt. And then Nuno helped me uh, put a band together amongst the people uh, is this fellow Carl Re- Restivo, who comes out of New Jersey. And Carl was, uh, he played guitar and produced along with Wyclef Jean. Um, hips, hips, don't, what is it? Hips don't lie. Hips, hips don't lie. Right. Some other songs. But um, Carl was a great bass player. Nuno was a great uh, guitarist, and he did great producing, too, uh, along with Steve Lillywhite. So Steve Lillywhite signed the project. I think it was on Columbia. And then they fired fired Steve. Uh Uh-oh. They fired Donnie Einer. They fired the entire floor that worked on the, uh, at least my record. And then I went out on the road with no tour support, no support at all. Wow. So I was not, I, I'm with you, man. It was a great record. So what I did was I bought the record, all the rights back from them. And I carried it through time because yeah. something told me, you know, don't let them, it was really, it was Jim Morrison. And I had like a responsibility to Jim Morrison's family to not fail. Right, right. So, so I, I just said, no, give me the, give me the music back. And then when I ran across Last Man and Ian uh, Jenkinson, Ian Benchley is at Last Man. They, I told them, I've got this record. And I gave the, I gave them a, a listen and they're like, okay, we're putting this out. We're re- putting this out. We're getting remixes on it. And so far we've got um, Groove Armada has done remixes for it. Yes. 
like I say, I, um, Sammy and Guy, and then um, uh, Sasha's coming soon. Awesome. Awesome. And, th- and then there's more people, but uh, I-, I can't remember their name. <laughs> What's wonderful about what they're doing? Because they're new, they're up and comers. So I'm letting, I'm letting, you know, not letting, I'm, I'm honored to be working with the legends like Sasha and, um, um, Groove Armada. Uh, we worked with, uh, uncle James, uh, Lavelle uh, on a track from kind heaven. And it was called, let's all pray for this world. That was a beautiful remix. So what I like to do, David, is I like to make a beautiful song that can be used, repurposed in the music world. And then I would work, I would hope to work with a genius digital producer that would take it and... uh, remake sense out of it uh-huh. <laughs> and then remake remake repurpose it and turn it into a beautiful tapestry of sound wow that's that's great is the is the current state of things with covid making it difficult at all for you to collaborate has that impacted you in any way it's made it better in uh, certain ways because we are at this all the time because we can't go out so that's the only reason it's better. But as far as consistency and doing it and actually recording, no, we've become quite prolific because we're now recording, you know, three, four days a week. Got it. Got it. Yep. Sure. So there's been some focus. Uh, so guys, we're, we're, we're uh, starting to get uh, short on time here. Um, so I I got a couple. I just got a couple other questions that I want to get to. Um, oh, oh, one other thing uh, though on the ultra payloaded. Which studio was that recorded at, Perry? Did you say? Ultra payloaded. It might have been Hanson. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Hanson Studios, old Charlie Chaplin studio. Because I remember running into Audio Slave. Wow. When Chris was alive i had pictures with him and, and audio slave and then us and satellite party great yep yeah well that sounds like a meeting of the minds <laughs> yeah to, to me uh perry you you talk so much about collaboration uh i want to know if, if uh, and this is a question for both of you for both dustin and perry if each of you could go into the studio with any artist living or no longer with us, or not even artist, just anybody. Who would that be? You got one? Uh, man, I mean, it, uh, Joy Division in the studio or David wow. Bowie. Or, wow. you know, that, that would have been phenomenal just to, to, to be in the room for those things. I would say the Beatles, man. I'm man. sorry. Now yeah, you're going, true. oh. <laughs> Yeah, the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> All right, okay, yep. It's hard to shake a stick at that. All right. Yeah, you <laughs> can't. Sorry, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, Pink Floyd would be awesome. Yeah. Um, Jeez, yeah. I mean, the list would go. It's, yeah, endless. <laughs> I my first impulse was Johnny Cash, though. I yeah. gotta tell you, I'm like, man. And then I thought, like, who would be a singer that you'd want to get this beautiful, pure voice? Uh, and I thought Elvis would be interesting. Okay. Yep. But okay. Now I'll tell you my last, my, I have one last one. Okay. I have never been in the studio with Brian Eno. Okay. Yeah. That's who I would really love to be in a studio with. Right. Yeah. All absolutely. Right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I would like to be in a studio with any of them. David those. Byrne. Sure. Yep. I, yeah, I'm, David Byrne. I David was Byrne in a studio sure. with David Byrne, but we weren't working together. <laughs> I just saw him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, we should make that happen. Um, so yeah. All right. All right. Well, guys, we we've talked about so much. Uh, this is this has been fabulous. Uh, I I could talk to both of you <laughs> for, for another hour. Um, 
Uh, anything else you want to cover? Anything else we can discuss about audio? Yeah. Yes. Should, yeah. Should we fade out on Mariachi Stop? I think play a little bit of the song. Stop I think that's a mariachi. Uh, Beat out. We'll, we'll, yeah. I guess I'll worry about the licensing implications of that uh, some other time. Yeah, don't worry about it. I say you can do it. All right. Okay. I say you can do it. I own it. I own it. I own it. All right. So we're, oh, all right. All right. Hey, let, let's just say that way. Hit it. He <laughs> looks like he can't believe it. See you, David.